with all of you. We're excited to talk about uh, the new innovations that we brought to the table and, and the things we're doing to help our customers. So that's really terrific. Um, the marketing folks asked me to remind you that it's a hashtag ramp inno if you want to tweet about the event uh, while it's going on here. You're going to hear through the course of the next couple days context shifting between media and enterprise. You've already started to pick up on that. Um, and so we'll weave those stories into a lot of these presentations and topics. Um, but you'll see that at times, you know, we're going to focus on enterprise and times uh, on media as well. So that's, uh, that's something that we've woven through here. So the, the notion of a keynote is always a little bit uh, ominous and you think, you know, what the heck am I going to talk about? And so I thought to myself, you know, who's the seer of wisdom and, and all knowing and never wrong in my life uh, who can give me some advice? So of course I asked my wife. And uh, she said, well, look, dummy, just talk about something you know really well. Uh, and, and as Stu pointed out, you know, it occurred to me that this notion of content discovery has fascinated me personally um, throughout my career. And so I wanted to give you a kind of a short timeline of content discovery. Uh, I've lived every aspect of this uh, from, a, uh, from a professional standpoint and, uh, and continue on here at RAMP to do that as well. So let me take you on this little journey here and, and we'll talk about um, content discovery and its evolution. So why is this an interesting topic? Why is this a hard topic? Um, well, you can see that you know, from this little timeline here, things were pretty quiet you know, going back into the 70s. There were a limited number of places that you could actually discover content. You had television, which was you know, all appointment television. You basically tuned in when you wanted to watch a program. You could read the newspaper. Again, the newspaper was laid out the way the editors felt it should be laid out. And that's how you would discover content there. Uh, and the same was true of things like radio, right? So radio was, uh, what was on was on. And if you missed it, you missed it. You can see here the compression uh, beginning in 2000 of just a plethora of ways that content could be delivered to you and therefore discovered. In addition, the amount of content, when you think about the entire archive of content that's ever been produced, suddenly was able to be moved online. So not only was it new content that was uh, there for you to try to find, it was also archive content that could be contextually relevant, you know, if you're reading a story and you're trying to understand the history of that story. And this continues to happen. Certainly in audio and video, not all of the archives are even digital yet, but most of the media companies that we talk to, that's an active process and they're moving more, more and more of that online. So what happens when you have a lot of something? Well, you have a search and a context uh, and a content discovery problem. And that's been this, this topic that's been so intriguing uh, and I want to talk, you, talk to you about that evolution. So I broke these into sort of four phases uh, in terms of how I, I've thought about content discovery. And it occurred to me that the first was really an editorial web, right? The editorial discovery process. And what you had here was the explosion of websites onto this thing called the internet. Um, I certainly remember the very first time I saw the internet. I'm, I'm sure you do as well. Um, I was, there was this guy in, in sort of this uh, networking group I was in, he said, I want to show the group this thing, you know, and he brings up this thing called a browser and it's kind of spinning really slowly and slowly this site comes up and, uh, and it's Yahoo, right? It's a little trivia, trivia test, what does Yahoo stand for? Anybody know? Yet another highly officious oracle. That is what Yahoo stands for. That's a true story. Uh, and so uh, J uh, Jerry Yang and David Philo thought, you know, we're going to organize the web using editors. We're going to have this nice taxonomy. Sounded like a great idea. It certainly lacked scale, which we'll talk about in a second. But a number of these came up. Um, I'm not sure if any remember the Open Directory project, which was sponsored by Netscape. Same thing. This is a, the first real Wikipedia, right? You had editors dispersed around the world who were basically c furiously categorizing these websites as, the, as they would appear on the internet. And you could submit a website. Um, and, and for them to review it and catalog it. Well, you can guess what happened, started to happen next. You started to have people wanting to game the system, influence the editors, and that was really the dawn of, of this whole battle for uh, discovery on the web, right? I've got this great site. You really, we, sh we shouldn't be listed just in autos. We should also be in lifestyle, you know, and you had people trying to coerce the editors to do those kinds of things. Um, it certainly led to the creation of the portal, right? So once you had people putting eyeballs on these directories, um, the natural thing to do was to, hey, we can sell them, we can place advertisements there. Uh, we can try to maybe sell them stuff. And so we're all familiar with sort of the, the dawn of AOL, um, Excite, Lycos. This was, a, this was the sort of dot-com boom, right? I remember going to see Excite and they had the slide in the office you could go down. It was, it was craziness uh, in terms of the, uh, the money going into these, these portal businesses. Uh, and so, uh, this is a case where eyeballs were being consolidated, you know, on these homepage of these portals. 
And content discovery from a professional standpoint, if you were a, a media company, was really driven by these tenancy deals. So if you recall back when uh, the dot-com boom was going on, if you started a company, let's say you started a, an auto classifieds company, the first thing your VCs would say is, which portal tenancy deals can we get? And the portals picked up on this, right? So they would start to basically have these auctions for these giant uh, sections within these portals. And, and I was at uh, Lycos at the time running uh, search and publishing uh, across Europe and the Americas, and I saw this going on firsthand. And basically, it was sort of like this, this mafia thing where we would put four competitors in separate conference rooms, and we would make them bid for the tenancy placement inside the Lycos portal. And we were charging you know, $50 million up front to get these tenancy deals. And if you were able to announce a tenancy deal, your stock would triple, right? And so that was the whole content discovery game there, was get onto these portals. And of course, the portals controlled a lot of the eyeballs. But in terms of, you know, when we think about audio and video at this time, not so much, right? 288 modems, uh, the dreaded dial-up tones, uh, and, and the screech of the modem, and it was just not something that was going to be conducive for video, right? The video would just take forever. Um, and I saw a, a TED talk of uh, Bill Gross from Idea Lab, and he was talking about understanding uh, what drives the success of a startup. And he said, really, it's all about timing. And he had launched a portal called Z.com at the time, which was going to be all video. But of course, there was no way it was going to work, right? Not, not on that kind of internet. Um, and so he was saying, you know, a lot, a, lot of, a lot in life is timing, and he was right about that. So in each of these phases, I want to kind of think about the kingmaker, too. So you'll see as I move through these phases, we'll talk about um, the kingmaker. So who was really the kingmaker of the editorial web? Um, it was the homepage. And I remember at Lycos, you know, having these pilgrimages to the VP of homepage. There was always a VP of homepage, and that was a plum job. Like, that was the, the top of the pyramid. And we would have a session with the VP of homepage, and we would come with our metrics and our stats, and we'd argue for a few more pixels on the homepage, right? The search box needs to be wider. I can prove to you that I'm going to drive more traffic if you make the search box wider, which would, of course, drive uh, the metrics of the business that I was running. And then the, the dating uh, GM would come and say, look, we need to put more thumbnails on the homepage so we can promote dating. And of course, this is a zero-sum game. You didn't have an infinite homepage. Uh, and so that was a fascinating, fascinating dance that went on. And of course, we had homepages in Europe and in the US and in Latin America. And so you do the same thing with each, each VP of homepage. Uh, and so they were, they were all powerful at the time. The second phase of the web, um, I term the algorithmic web, right? So what happened here is the amount of content quickly outstripped the ability for editors to manage and categorize and do all of this. And so you have a bunch of smart people in different corners of, of primarily the United States, but, but also overseas. And, and uh, our friend uh, John Lever from Fast is here, where, where I uh, uh, worked for uh, quite a while as well. And you had this notion that there needed to be a better way to discover, uh, index, and categorize all of this content. Not websites, but web pages. And what you have is, you know, Lycos out of Carnegie Mellon in inventing the Lycos spider. Um, I noticed that they just finally sold all the remaining patents for Lycos, uh, which were the original web crawling patents that they invented. Um, Alta Vista, of course, uh, uh, grew up out of California. And I found this funny, uh, this funny original Google homepage. Uh, uh, you can see you can search Stanford or you can search the web there. Uh, and of course, Google invents this concept of page rank. Uh, which, is a, which is a seminal moment in the web, right? It, it figures out that the way pages are linked together is a voting mechanism or a popularity mechanism or a quality mechanism. And it changes the way people search uh, and, and organizes this content. To this day, continues to be uh, this incredibly powerful way to find content. So the kingmaker here, as you'd expect, the Google homepage, page one of the search results. This kicks off an incredible battle for real estate. Getting on page one is the whole game, right? 90% of traffic comes from the first page of the Google search results. Nobody paginates. No one goes to the second page. And not only that, 60% uh, of the clicks come from the top three results. I mean, that's incredible. So you're talking about 90% and 60%, that's it. If you can be top three on Google, you have it made. So the same way the VP of homepage uh, was, was all powerful, Google is all powerful, and those top three clicks are all powerful, which of course sets off all sorts of craziness around black hat SEO and, and all of the games that people tried to play to game the system, um, but also uh, launches the dawn of search engine marketing, right? Overture, uh, and then Google uh, with pay-per-click marketing, and that transforms the revenue profile of the internet 
as a, as a business uh, and, and continues to to this day. Um, the top three results in Google are still incredibly important. Uh, and we'll talk about over the course of the next few days how audio and video, as Stu mentioned in the, the innovations uh, timeline there, is so difficult because it's opaque, this opaque content that's not easily indexed, searched, and something that we've focused on solving um, since, we, uh, since we started the company. What about audio and video uh, as part of the algorithmic web? Well, bandwidth has picked up at this point. Um, you can actually play video on the web. Um, obviously, it's YouTube, right? Video on the web uh, is nothing but YouTube. And audio, podcasts are rolling along. And uh, you had, the, who was the MTV VJ? I can't think of his name now, who was sort of the godfather, self-anointed godfather of podcasts. And Adam Curry. Adam Curry, thank you. One time, and I actually got an email from Adam Curry once, and he sent me this really nasty email, and he said, you know, you're trying to automate the indexing of these podcasts, and that's you know against the editorial uh, uh, vision for this, and sometimes they're even wrong, and how dare you? And I said, like, wow, I got an email from Adam Curry. That's kind of cool. <laughs> 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 and of course, Rick shows up, right? He is the, the poster child for, uh, uh, for YouTube, uh, certainly prolongs his career, career by several decades, right? Uh, and, uh, you, and you see a lot of this. So entertainers, media companies begin to figure out that uh, getting onto YouTube is going to be something that's important. YouTube grows its business to a billion uniques. Um, and so, we, you know, even today we have now this big challenge if you're a media company with trying to figure out how do I leverage some of these giant audiences like YouTube and Facebook but still maintain a real business model for myself. Um, and we'll talk about that over the course of the next day and a half as well. Phase three, the social web. And so we're sort of just coming out of phase three now. Um, but the social web the way PageRank figured out how to create a quality proxy for web pages, the social web figured out how to create a quality proxy for people and content. So now the social graph dominates, right? It's very important in the social web phase to make sure that every piece of content you have has its own social graph, which are likes, right? You need lots of thumbs up. Um, and that you understand the social graph of your audience and that you're, as you as an individual understands your own social graph and builds your own social graph. Whether it's LinkedIn professionally, Facebook for you know, personal and professional, we have the arrival of Yammer and Jive and, and the, the, enterprise, the social enterprise arrives. And you see that more and more now where the enterprise itself trying to understand its social graph. Where are my centers of excellence? Where are my centers of knowledge? And how do I connect those people together if they're located in different countries? Uh, and so the social graph comes to the enterprise as well. Video, of course, goes nuts, right? So video goes mainstream. You have all the acronyms, OTTs, MCNs, OVPs, TV Everywhere, Enterprise Video. Um, and all of these deliver and take advantage of two key things. The bandwidth has increased to the point where it's viable uh, and mobile, right? And so, of course, if you you know, if you look at the amount of, of bits and bytes flowing on the internet and the mobile internet, um, the amount that's uh, represented by video is astounding and is, is going to grow to over 80% of bits flowing over the internet are going to be video by 2017, according to uh, Cisco studies here. And you can see the over-the-top growth um, is just tremendous. And of course, most of you probably have kids in this room. Um, you know that kids just are not watching television uh, that way anymore. So my teenagers don't sit in the family room and watch television with us. They have their own personal television experiences on tablets and smartphones. It's all on demand. I think they watch almost no linear television, maybe with the exception of, of sports. Um, but even then, a lot of it's in replay or clips and so forth. Um, and as Jim pointed out, they're communicating with each other over image and video almost exclusively. Um, so Facebook now, if you have teenagers, you know Facebook is, is what they use to find out what the assignment is in science. They don't use it to communicate with each other. Um, they're using Twitter, they're using Snapchat, um, and, uh, and they're using increasingly video versions of those. So it's always strange to be riding the car and your daughter's in the back seat, you know, doing all this kind of thing constantly through the whole trip. But uh, that, is what, uh, that is what they're used to. They are becoming multimedia communicators, and there's no going back on that. And they're going to expect that um, when they arrive at work, you know, and in the products you deliver um, as a media company as well. So the kingmaker for the social web, well, not surprisingly here, it's the news feed, right? It is the, uh, the news feed is the whole game. So media companies have seen referrals 
from Facebook jump to almost half their traffic in some cases. This is where people are getting their news. Um, this is where they're, they're encountering new content. It's where they're watching movie trailers. Um, and on the other side of it, if you are a content provider, and let's be generous and call Kim a content provider, uh, <laughs> your ability to assemble your own social graph and control that means you can build a huge business from that. You know, I think some celebrities get 15, 25, $35,000 for one tweet. And it's come to uh, uh, the enterprise as well. So the enterprise social feed, you know, whether it's LinkedIn, which is sort of a, a hybrid, uh, or even inside the enterprise where you're looking for uh, subject matters or you're looking to collaborate and discuss key topics and things like that. So where are we now? Um, we've kind of exited these, these three. Um, they're all still present today. It's not like they went away. If you think back to the editorial web and, and sort of the portal tenancy model, that has uh, not gone away, it's just been renamed. It's now called native advertising. And it's a little more algorithmic than these big business development deals. Um, but native advertising is really a form of, of tenancy, right? You're trying to take those eyeballs and guide them to a piece of content, um, and the content marketing uh, game is certainly there. Um, if we think about um, the algorithmic web, search engine marketing, search engine optimization, those are all just still uh, blocking tackling you gotta do in your business. And social, of course, everyone now, if you're running a media company um, or even an enterprise, has a team that does nothing but nurture and figure out social. Um, I mean, I came up here and the first thing I did was remind, reminded you of, of our Twitter hashtag, right? So the impact social can have is, is so important. So let me summarize for a minute. <clears throat> if the editorial web is all about people looking for websites, right? That's where we started. You have lots of people, not much content. And so people looking for websites, direct navigation is still the primary way that people were, were finding stuff, right? You type in excite.com. The algorithmic web changed in that it really became people looking for content. So instead of websites, I'm looking for a particular piece of content. So deep linking into these things, making sure all of your content can be exposed and indexed properly, critical. And that was really uh, the dawn of the algorithmic web. The social web has all been about people looking for people, right? So uh, whether you're, you're searching or you're linking to, I mean, how many times on LinkedIn every day do you get people uh, popping up wanting to link to you? You build up your own social graph and LinkedIn's done that very clever thing which says your network is now 4.2 million people, right? Using the sort of two degrees of Kevin Bacon concept. Um, and, uh, and it's always a fun number to look at. Um, and you know, even within Ramp, one of the things we've done this year is, is be much more forceful and proactive with the employees to say, you all need to link to everybody here, right? Because when you do the math, it's crazy how many connections a company can have if every employee links to each other uh, and links to the company, and then it's just this giant uh, content distribution engine uh, that's easy and, and free and, and takes advantage of, of this uh, tremendous growth in the social graph. So where are we now? I call this the personal web. I think that's what we're moving into uh, in this next phase. And the big change here, uh, if you went back to that, uh, that first slide, uh, the first uh, version of this I had, it was sort of like a pyramid, people looking for uh, a small amount of content. Now you have a ton of content, including brands, right? Brands are all becoming media companies themselves, having to produce content. Obviously, the auto industry's produced video for a long time. They're, they're needing to repurpose that as content itself. And so this is really content looking for people. It's completely inverted when you think about it at this point going forward. So much content, so much at stake, and the user's really having the power because this user is connected to their social graph, and so getting them to like something or consume something or share something is so, so important. So as you think forward here, in conclusion, in terms of who is the next kingmaker, it really is all about you, right? And you being a proxy for either you sitting here in the audience or your users or your employees. And so I had a lot of fun here with Google Images, it looks like. <laughs> <coughs> but uh, it, it is, and, and when you think about how you're designing your, your content strategy, uh, both inside and outside the firewall, be cognizant of the fact that, as Jim pointed out, and we'll, you know, we've talked about millennials a fair bit, but this is who's moving onto the internet and, and within your company, they're expecting that these content experiences know something about them. Uh, there's context awareness for what they're trying to accomplish. You see Google building in uh, with uh, Google Now, now building in these contextual 
uh, aware recommendations and, and content suggestions and reminders. And Jim mentioned his watch, right, which, which is uh, uh, buzzing when it's time to go to the next appointment or to make a left turn. Um, this is all about this cloud understanding you as an individual. So that's what I urge as you go through the re next couple days here. Think about that as, as, a, as a big secular trend, uh, which, isn't, which isn't going in reverse. And again, this isn't that we've abandoned the first three phases. They're just all present now and, and have led up to this moment where uh, we have this personal web. And I think it's a, a really thrilling and exciting moment and lots to, lots to do and figure out from a product and technology and, and business standpoint. So uh, again, welcome to Boston. We're very excited about the next day and a half, and I appreciate your time.